All right, good evening. Good evening. I'd now like to bring the regular evening meeting of the Township of Langley Council to order. And uh, the first item is the adoption and receipt of the agenda items. Could I have a motion, please? Council Quali and second by Council Sparrow. Uh, all those in favor? Opposed and carried. Uh, the, first, uh, the next item is a day of mourning. And this is a moment of silence that will be observed for the annual day of mourning for workers killed and injured on the job. Uh, and that, that is uh, observed on April 28th, uh, but Council is sitting here today. So I'd ask those that are able to, to please stand and we'll uh, observe a moment of silence. Okay, and the next item is the adoption of uh, the minutes from regular evening council meeting of April 9th and the public hearing of April 9th. Could I have a motion, please? Yeah. Councillor Arneson, second by Councillor Davis. Uh, any errors or omissions? <coughs> All those in favor? Opposed and carried. And now we move on to presentations. And uh, we have the first presentation is the Walnut Grove Gators. Welcome here. And uh, you've, you've done our township proud in winning the uh, annual uh, 2018 Junior Girls Basketball tournament at Langley Event Center uh, for British Columbia. So con congratulations. And uh, it's a tremendous accomplishment uh, for all of you outstanding young basketball players to, to bring the trophy home to, uh, oh, there you all are, that's excellent, to bring the trophy home to Langley. And uh, a lot of hard work and commitment was shown by the team members, the coaches, and the manager, and the result was being named the best in BC. You set an exemplary example for athletes of all ages in our community, and you should be very proud. So we have some certificates for you. So when I call your name, I'll just ask you to come forward and Councillor Qualley will assist.
All right. Well, it's always good to see our young people, uh, such high achievers. So now we move on to delegations. And uh, the first delegation is Reverend Paul Guiton. If, uh, please come forward. And uh, as all the delegations know, you have five minutes. So, Pastor Paul. Oh, it, it, it connects pretty good. Yeah. Thank you. Bit of a tough act to follow. Thanks a whole bunch. <laughs> Mayor Froze and members of council, thank you for this opportunity to let you know about an important initiative that is taking place in our community. The third annual walk in the spirit of reconciliation will be taking place May 25th through 27th. I would like to acknowledge that I speak to you on the unceded traditional territories of the Kwantlen, Khitsi, Matsqui, and Semiamu peoples. And let me begin by briefly enjoy, uh, introducing some of our organizing committee. My name is Paul Guitton. I'm representing the Anglican Church here in Langley. Cecilia Riki is from the uh, Heisler Nation. Uh, Peter van der Le and Eleanor van der Leek are from Willoughby Christian Reformed Church. Uh, we have uh, folks from the Langley Mennonite Fellowship who couldn't be with us this evening. Sophia Ducey is rep representing the United Churches of Langley. And Josette Dandurand, an elder of the Kwantlen Nation, is also part of our team, but couldn't be with us tonight. Three years ago, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, under the leadership of Mr. Justice, now Senator Murray Sinclair, published a series of 94 calls to action to Canadians as a framework to commence the journey of reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. There are specific suggestions for different levels of government, as you know, but there are also some calls to action for churches and other faith groups, specifically number 61.3, which says community-controlled education and relationship-building projects. And that is exactly what the Walk in the Spirit of Reconciliation is, a community-controlled education and relationship-building project right here in Langley. We walk from Fort Langley, which was, quite frankly, thanks to its history, a bastion of early colonialism, to the site of the nearest Indian residential school, St. Mary's in Mission. Along the way, there will be many opportunities for people to educate themselves about the history of residential schools and its impact on survivors over many generations. Yet the walk has many other purposes. It garners some attention here in the community, which puts reconciliation in the front of the people in our area. It offers us all the opportunity to reflect on our history and our present, and to consider the importance of reconciliation in our community. The fact that settlers are prepared to make this long walk is a sign to our indigenous sisters and brothers. A residential school survivor who walked with us last year expressed that he was deeply moved that white people were willing to do something like this. In fact, while we very much support, appreciate the support of people of indigenous background, this call to action is primarily for settlers. Too often, we are sitting back and expecting First Nations to do the heavy lifting around reconciliation, which honestly simply perpetuates the problem. Above all, the reality is that reconciliation takes place between people. It is the repairing of fractured relationships. It doesn't happen at an institutional level. For example, many of our church denominations have given apologies many years ago without fundamentally changing the nature of relationships between settlers and indigenous peoples, frankly, even between churches and indigenous peoples. Yes, this walk is being sponsored by churches. Some of our denominations were actively involved in the running of residential schools, which means, in my view, that we have a moral obligation to provide leadership in reconciliation initiatives. But others in our groups were not members of the so-called settlement churches, but recognized that at the very core of Christianity, actually at the core of every religion, is the injunction to love your neighbor as yourselves. Well, we didn't. So it is totally appropriate that acts of reconciliation like this one be spearheaded by faith groups, but by no means is participation limited to church members or people of any faith. 
The invitation is to everyone who wants to show that they care about the relationship between indigenous and non-indigenous folks in our community. And so we are here to invite you, Mr. Mayor and members of council, to walk with us at least some of the way. It was gratifying to see some members of council at the Bright New Day initiative last year. Let me suggest that this walk may be a continuation of that journey. Of course, in the future, the dream is that this becomes a mutually sacred walk where settlers and indigenous folks walk side by side, sharing their stories. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that invitation, and I'm looking forward to being on part of it with you. Are there any questions? Thank you. Any questions? Councillor Qualley? Thank you. Thanks for your presentation. Um, I'm really sorry that I'm going to miss the walk this year. It's the same weekend that um, I'll be participating in a conference, a government conference in, uh, um, in Halifax. So I'm sorry to miss the walk. And uh, um, I wish you tremendous success with it. And I will be there in spirit. Thank you so much. Councillor Arneson? Yes, thank you so much for coming. Um, I know some councillors did go to the event, the Bright New Day, and I'm assuming that, um, well, I'll have to check my calendar, but I'll make sure I clear a few dates, and um, I'm hoping there might be an opportunity for people to, like you've suggested, just do a segment of, of the walk as opposed to the whole walk, although <laughs> I'm sure it's really good exercise and you probably have some good food <laughs> involved in the experience, but I just say I'm so pleased that you've come tonight to tell us and remind us about it because I think it's wonderful and a way to um, reconnect our, our communities and to make sure that we're, I'm going to call it, reweaving our fabrics together. So thank you very much. Thank you. And absolutely, if I may just confirm that transportation is available so that people can walk as far as they can, if they feel as though they can make it and then come back to their starting point. And, and uh, anybody is welcome to participate in as much or as little of the walk as they feel able. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for that presentation. Okay, the next delegation is uh, Mr. Brian Martins, the New Westminster and District Labour <coughs> Council. And this um, certainly uh, we just had the moment of silence and thank you for coming to explain a little bit uh, more of what that was all about. Appreciate that. Thank you. I do have a bit of a presentation. I'm hoping that I'm able to okay. just focus on here. Hopefully it will flip through automatically. If not, I'll try to do my best. Thank you, good evening, Mayor Froze, uh, members of council. My name is Brian Martins, um, and I am a delegate of the New Westminster and District Labor Council. Um, my home is from Walnut Grove. Um, each year, the New Westminster and District Labor Council presents to councils and school boards within our region to seek their support and recognition of April 28th as the day of mourning. For workers killed and injured on the job, I'd like to thank um, the council this, uh, at this moment uh, for the moment of silence that we observed at the beginning of uh, this meeting. This presentation is uh, designed to be informative as we believe workplace health and safety is everyone's responsibility. The purpose of the day of mourning is really twofold, to remember workers killed and injured on the job um, and to rededicate ourselves to preventing future injuries through education. Positive change happens when we all work together. Education is a key to prevention and unions are leading the way. The BC Federation of Labour's Health and Safety Centre has evolved into a centre of excellence for occupational health and safety uh, training and education. The center's programming is open to everyone, regardless of the current work status, including students and employers. The center has helped thousands of workers, organizations, and companies know their rights and their responsibilities for <laughs> workplace safety. This year, the BC Labour Heritage Center has partnered with groups, including the BC Teachers Federation, QPBC, and WorkSafe BC, to actively engage more schools and participate in their Day of Mourning at BC Schools project. Many students and young people don't know the dangers they may face at work and their rights as a worker. As a consequence, young workers are the most vulnerable group in the workforce and they are statistically more likely to suffer injury or death in the workplace. Workers in BC can enter the workplace as young as 12 years of age. In BC, an average of 27 young workers have time loss injuries every day. And every week, seven young workers are permanently disabled in British Columbia. The BC Labour Heritage Centre provides resources to schools and teachers to promote student awareness of their rights to safe workplace and to help them understand the importance of the day of mourning and the importance of honouring workers killed and seriously injured on the job.
The specific goal of the project is to reduce the number of deaths and injuries among young workers. This year, we are also highlighting the issue of workplace violence and harassment. The Canadian Labour of Congress has launched a campaign called Violence and Harassment, Not Part of the Job, to bring awareness to the fact that many workers are at risk of violence in their workplace, and all workers, regardless of workplace, sector, or industry, can suffer from bullying and harassment at work uh, from employers, clients, customers, or co-workers. Education and prevention are critical to identifying and reducing the risk of violence in the workplace. Violence prevention programs must be developed and implemented as part of the overall workplace health and safety programs in workplaces where risk of violence are identified. Teachers, healthcare workers, first responders, public service and government employees, customer servant agents, and those who work alone are all examples of workers who are vulnerable to violence from the public in their workplaces. Employers, workers, and unions all have roles to play in coming together to make workplaces safe and free from violence. Bullying and harassment are also being recognized as significant factors for injury to workers. More and more people are speaking out about the importance of mental health at home, at school, and at work. Bullying and harassment in the workplace can take many forms, including verbal aggression, personal attacks, and other actions de uh, designed to intimidate or humiliate. If workplace bullying and harassment is not addressed, it can lead to lost productivity, anxiety, and depression, and these effects can be felt by our families and our communities. Bullying and harassment are recognized by WorkSafe BC as compensable workplace injuries. We all must ensure procedures are in place to respond to complaints, to address incidents, and ensure future bullying and harassment is prevented or minimized. Mental health and safety are as important as physical health and safety for workers on the job, and injuries can be every bit as debilitating. It is critically important that violence, bullying, and harassment in the workplace are all addressed through prevention, education, and positive action. Workplace death and serious injuries and disease do not discriminate, nor are they random and without cause. In 2016, 144 workers in BC died from work-related injury or illness. By working together, we can ensure all workers stay safe and our communities are healthy and strong. Local government support for the day of mourning is a building block for this important work. Everyone here today can help us make a difference. Be safety conscious, support accountability measures, and health and safety education in your workplace. As you've seen in our slides, Union leaders and members, government leaders and employers gathered together April 28th to mark this important day for workers. I invite you to join us Saturday, April 28th at 11 a.m. at Pier Park in New Westminster to commemorate the day of mourning for workers killed and injured on the job. Thank you very much for your time. Well, thank, thank you, you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, we do appreciate it. Perfect. Okay, the next uh, delegation is uh, Diane Kask. Want to click it each time? Yeah, every time you want to pass the slide. Okay. So you just click, Good. Click it Thank you. Okay, good evening, Mayor and Councillors. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Is this okay? Can you hear me? Oh, good. Thank you. Very well. Uh, we need to, we need to this is on the revitalization of downtown Aldergrove. We need to choose new development wisely for downtown Aldergrove. This needs to be done to attract middle income residents which will have a disposable income to spend at businesses in town. A percentage of low income and seniors housing should be incorporated into the developments but to be sure development is well maintained and business can be supported, there needs to be residents with disposable incomes to maintain properties. One of the Township Housing Action Plan key messages emphasizes the positive outcomes of mixed generational, mixed income communities. Aldergrove already has a large amount of lower income housing and we need more middle income housing mixed with seniors housing and adequate family rental housing as stated in the age friendly plan. This is new development that enhances Aldergrove. The downtown core plan states five and six story buildings with retail on the first floor. Here are some suggestions of what they could look like. Notice the discrete signage for businesses. More ideas for development that invites people to downtown. 
The age-friendly plan states sidewalks and open spaces need to be safe for strollers and scooters, so we really appreciate the township for addressing the sidewalk and traffic problems that were documented in my email of March the 8th. Open spaces add to the comfort of walking in town. Okay, don't know what happened there. There. Housing development that caters to children needs to have two, three, and three bedroom with den options and spacious playgrounds in natural settings. It may be hard to see in this next picture, but there is a beaver lodge in a preserved natural setting beside the playground. Playground with a beaver pond at the back. This example is from Olympic Village in Vancouver. And there's a beaver lodge. Notice how there's a beaver lodge and there's high rises. I know Alder Grove probably won't be having high rises soon, but the idea here is that we are wanting to enhance um, Bertrand Creek, and that is in the core plan. And so we can have natural settings alongside with high rises and or five story buildings. There is a wish among many Alder Groveans to change the look of Alder Grove to a more heritage style, which is also part of the Alder Grove core plan. Residents have said that they would like Alder Grove to look more like Fort Langley. With new development happening, this would be the time to develop that style. On page 27 of the Alder Grove core plan, number nine states, create a greener downtown that provides parks, street trees, and protects and enhances Virgin Creek as an ecological feature and focal point. On page 29 of the Alder Grove core plan, it states that key elements of the plan are urban parks and plazas located throughout the downtown. The 2010 Alder Grove core plan includes a variety of features to welcome people into the downtown, including housing, plazas, parks, landscaping, and walkways. When individual development takes place and new businesses open, these guidelines need to be remembered so that downtown Alder Grove will be aesthetically pleasing, functional, and complement Burton Creek as a natural focus point, as stated in the Alder Grove core plan. I think that's it. Okay. Thank you very much for that presentation. I know we all like to see Alder Grove uh, thrive as all of our communities. Uh, we've got a couple of questions from Council. Uh, Council Arneson. Yes, thank you very much for coming. Um, it was a great overview and a, a refresher actually on our core plan for the downtown of Alder Grove. Um, and so I just wanted to say thank you very much for bringing it forward. And uh, I would like to actually refer your delegation information to staff and especially our social planner because it does have components, I think, that are um, relevant to what we're doing. And perhaps we could also ask for a report back to council regarding how we're doing in terms of the implementation of our plan along the timeline. So okay. thank you. Thank you. Council Davis. Thank you very much. You had mentioned on page 27 of the uh, plan focal points or plazas and you'd mentioned landscaping. Um, would you, like we're thinking of the new pool there, um, it's a, it, would you have any suggestions or, on what they could do to maybe make it more uh, pleasing? Or? Well, the front of it, the sidewalk goes right to the front. So there can't be anything there. I was hoping that there'd be some trees or within the swimming area, um, be places because, well, we need some sort of shade because we can't have just open in the heat and people having picnics without any shade in the heat there. So there needs to be something. And I don't think if you're going to start planting trees now, it would have to, it wouldn't be ready for this summer, definitely. Um, but perhaps some smaller trees in, in the picnic area would be nice. Um, and they will we'll grow, make them so they can grow. But um, one thing I did notice um, is that we have like at... Old Jail and 268th, there is a business that sells collectibles. And in the Alder Grove core plan, it says anything that looks sort of untidy should be um, behind landscaping, behind trees and such. And there aren't any there. 
Uh, and so it, when going th through Alder Grove, if we look at the newer, any new businesses coming in, or the present businesses, perhaps we can think about um, the trees and wide sidewalks because right now, if you're walking with a friend, you can't pass anybody. Like it's, you can't walk through downtown Aldergrove with a friend having a conversation because if you pass anybody, um, well, first of all, you have to really watch the way you step because there's different places that are. Um, the sidewalks still need to be improved, and the sidewalks are narrow, and so that is why I'm coming to remind you of what the plan says. Thank you. Um, I, I noticed uh, you had a beaver pond right in town, and it, it strikes me that if you'd gone to Bob's old restaurant, you could see the beaver pond, but it's not quite as receptive as what I think the, uh, the <laughs> had, had there. Very popular with the uh, clientele. <laughs> yes, I can imagine. Anyhow, yes. we'd be glad to see it go to staff to uh, little things sometimes. You know, trees in and around a swimming pool are, are kind of high maintenance, but there's certain areas that, it, you know, you can put two or three trees and they look really nice. Yes. Thank you. Council Whitmarsh. Thank you. Um, the, right at the beginning of your presentation, you talked about having a community develop in such a way that it attracts middle income, uh, those with some disposable income. And yes. I'm wondering if you could just um, sort of restate uh, what kind of things would, would encourage middle income people to, to come to Aldergrove. What kind of development are you talking about that would attract disposable income to come there? Well, it does say um, in the plan that we're supposed to have five and six story buildings there. So I think um, housing and whatever, if we make it so that it looks like if you were go go to some other place where you would see um, a nicely built development, where um, the rooms are spacious inside, uh, like on a, a condo or something, that it's spacious, it's, it's nice. And um, so that, and the downtown as well, if we were to make it look attractive, that would attract people, if we could see an attractive downtown, if the new development, as in the new housing that goes in and apartments, whatever. Um, I believe that the BC government is actually sponsoring um, middle income development. And so perhaps we could use some, uh, some of that to encourage developers when they come to um, you talk to the BC government and to help them sponsor um, things being built down there, or houses being built down there, housing there that would attract middle-income people. It's interesting because we talk uh, a lot, of course, around uh, the topic of affordable housing, and this is a, a move to talk about middle-income housing. So it's a bit of a different strategy. So thanks for sharing. Okay, thank you. And I had thought, like, um, in the when they have middle-income, also they twenty, thirty percent of it make that same development as in seniors and low income development so that the maintenance is kept up. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next delegation is uh, Julie Clayton, Langley Human Dignity Co Coalition. Your Worship and Council Members, my name is Julie Clayton, and I'm the Chair of the Langley Human Dignity Coalition. 
I'm accompanied tonight by co-chair Balin Morthy, who is principal at Walnut Grove Secondary School and former principal of DW Poppy and the Langley Fine Arts School. We are here tonight because human dignity matters. No child should fear going to school because of bullying or exclusion. No person struggling with mental health should feel ignored or devalued. No person needing housing should be limited due to their social economic status. No one should be discriminated against because of their religious belief, their sexual identity, their ethnic background, their age or gender. Langley is a changing demographic. Over the last 10 years, we've seen a rising influx of immigrants and refugees, an increase in ethnic diversity. There are greater pressures for citizens in terms of the standard of living, rising incidents of youth homelessness, increase in seniors' population, issues of mental health, which are per pervasive amongst youth and adults, acknowledgement of our own responsibility to fulfill the national call to action in terms of truth and reconciliation with our Indigenous community, Kwantlen, Ketsi, Semiamu, and Matsqui First Nations. Clearly, the community of Langley is changing and in need of a united focus to make Langley a more caring and compassionate community. The risk is sitting on our laurels. The coalition started in Abbotsford over 20 years ago as part of the Fraser Valley Human Dignity Coalition. In 2016, Dr. Clayton approached me about the need for us to develop a Langley chapter. We're excited that since this discussion, we have grown our organization to include leaders within our community who strongly believe in our vision. Our executive includes Wendy Cook, from, uh, who's president of the Langley Teachers Association, Rosemary Wallace, school trustee, Jane Burton, one of the key executive members of uh, BC Special Olympics, Claire Gee from the BC Superintendents Association, Lenny Yoon, the teacher and district coordination coordinator of student leadership, Marnie Wilson, president of QP 1260, Councillor Rudy Storteboom from the city of Langley, our own Councillor Petrina Arneson from the township of Langley, and Constable Julie Beyond from the RCMP. Our general membership includes a network of over 45 combi combined individuals, organizations, social service agencies, schools and faith communities, all working together for inclusion and community wellness. Why are we here tonight? We want to provide information. We want to provide information about the activity and resources of the coalition. We are committed to ongoing community assessment, asking where there is in this community human dignity is being compromised. We are committed to education. Mandela said education is the most powerful weapon you can use to change the world. We are committed to public awareness, and that is the purpose of our delegation tonight. To date, our coalition has established the formation of an executive planning team, partnership development, establishment of a website. We have had two community discussion forums, one with community at large, over 80 in attendance, and more recently, last fall, 2017, a youth forum of over 60 students participating. We had presence at the Canada 150 celebrations in Fort Langley, and we have developed a 2018 strategic plan. Part of that strategic plan involves reaching out tonight to the township to help us take the coalition's work to a higher level of activity. And we hope by engaging uh, questions with you tonight, it will open the door for more conversation. We ask how could the coalition have greater connection to the township in terms of addressing issues relating to human dignity? How could we open up communication lines so what, then when the township becomes aware of human dignity issues, there's a connection made to the Human Dignity Coalition? How could the coalition become more involved in township events? And would you tonight uh, acknowledge the support of Councillor Petrina Arneson? And we'd like to request the annual appointment of a township representative to the coalition. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation, and uh, I appreciate that we do have a member of council on that, and it's a, it's a great request that you make. Councilor Arneson. Yes, thank you so much for coming. Um, I, I just have such a sense of what a valuable contribution that you're making to our community. I'm particularly happy that you have 
educated us tonight in terms of the broad exposure that you currently have with so many different groups. And um, I believe that there is uh, an upcoming event that you may be planning. Maybe you want to sort of pre-invite individuals or at least let them know the date of that event should they be able to attend. Yes, on um, May 2nd, we have a general membership meeting that will be taking place at Walnut Grove Secondary School. And it will be a dinner meeting uh, starting at 6 p.m. And it will be an opportunity to increase our partnerships and for more individuals in the community to become aware of the work and the initiatives of the coalition. And just to follow up on that, so contacting you, would that be the way yes. for people yes. to ensure that they can And go? Uh, the contact information can be found on our website. Yeah. Okay. Thank you yeah. so much for coming tonight. Very Thank much you. appreciated. Thank you very much. Okay, the next uh, delegation is Mr. Terry Metcalf from Langley Care Foundation. Oh, is Mr. Metcalf not here tonight? I didn't see him. Okay, I guess we'll move on and he might come to the next meeting. All right, so now we go to, um, uh, there are no, no reports to council, but there are bylaws for first and second reading, F1 is rezoning application number 100480 and development permit application number 100897 and bylaw 5358. Could I have a motion, please? Move. Councilor Davis, second by Councilor Sparrow. Any discussion on this? Councilor Richter. Um, yes, I was on council when this neighborhood plan was put together, and there are uh, pockets of very significant stands of trees uh, in uh, the Northeast Gordon Estate. And if we look at the map on page five of the plan, uh, you will see one of these pockets of trees uh, right in the subject site. And the land around this pocket of trees was designated residential bonus density two, and that was probably done specifically to protect those trees. Yet the application before us tonight says the integrated site design concept submitted by the applicant indicates that there are 225 significant trees on the subject site with only three proposed for retention. Now, if we have a plan and the intent of that plan is to protect a significant stand of trees, why are we even considering giving this first and second reading? This should go back to staff and ask staff to please work with the proponent to take advantage of the residential density uh, bonus there in order to protect those trees. So I would like to move referral of this back to staff for precisely that reason. We need, there's such dense development going on in throughout all of Willoughby and when we put plans together that are intended to protect major stands of trees, we should live by that plan, not cut down 225 of them because this developer maybe wants the bonus density without having to give back to the community in order to get it. Thank you. Mr. Backen, could you uh, or Mr. Seffi provide some... Uh background to the plan and to what uh, Councilor Richter is uh, referring just, to the trees. Just a brief summary that Mr. Seffi can kick, can uh, chime in. The challenge we face in this case is that the Councilor Richter's um, uh, analysis is, is uh, fairly accurate in that there is a bonus density area. We encourage the developer to preserve trees in exchange for the bonus density in this situation. They have made their application not to take advantage of the bonus density and instead to ask for the trees to be removed. Mr. Seffi, can you uh, perhaps elaborate a bit on the process we went through? Uh, Your Worship, uh, there is really not much to elaborate. It's exactly as Mr. Backen uh, stated. The uh, provision is there, and the, uh, I guess the mechanism through which we can protect tre trees is through uh, what we call a bonus density provision, which offers additional density for protection of those trees. It is not a requirement, it's a, it's a provision and an incent incentive, if you will, to try and, and persuade uh, landowners to try and protect those trees. And if they choose not to take advantage of those provisions, uh, the plan still 
uh, or the, the proposal still uh, does provide for, and the, the, the application in front of you is in compliance with the plan, they're just choosing not to take advantage of the density provisions. Yes, but why would we even have that in the plan if we didn't, at the time we made the plan, identify that as an area of importance to the community to keep? I mean, why even have it in the plan? I, I, I think we should just tell them, no, that's our plan. You need to live with our plan. We don't need to live with yours. And uh, if we can't refer this back to ask the developer to build around those trees, then I think we should just vote this whole thing down and tell the developer, you need to live by our plan. That's why we made a plan. Hey, Your Worship, just to clarify, what I was asking Mr. Suffy to explain was the fact that that discussion has taken place. So simply asking may not be sufficient if council agrees with the intent of the motion. It might be more important to direct as opposed to ask because we've actually seen that the provisions are there. They've exercised their a prerogative to suggest that they do not want the density. Council, though, under the provisions of use and density, could direct that the trees be preserved and that the bonus density be recognized if that's the direction of council. So okay, so I have to make a motion then to direct? So just, just let me clarify. So we would be then directing the, the proponent to increase the density in the area for that particular um, um, group of properties or those properties, and in exchange... Uh, that some of the trees would be preserved. Is that where we would direct them to increase density? Is Effectively, Mr. Seffi, is that the correct uh, uh, wording? That's correct, yes. Okay, I'll make that motion. Is there a seconder to that? Councillor Arneson seconds. I'll open up the amendment. Okay, Councillor Long. Well, thanks, George. I was going to ask, and I don't see in the report, a, a, re uh, a report from an arborist or some other explanation from... Uh, from somebody in the, um, you know, in, in the industry uh, uh, telling us what kind of trees they are and why they feel they're not worth uh, preserving. So now that we have a motion to direct staff, I think that that needs to certainly come back in this report um, because there must be, I mean, I don't see in, in the report any reason given other than I guess that there was a, a choice the, to, to either follow through with protection or not. But it would be helpful to know what kind of condition these trees are in. Mr. Um, Sefi, as far as the arborist report, uh, I'm just looking at some of the points here that uh, there would be, um, you know, uh, prior to, I guess, prior to this point number four, provision of final tree management plan incorporating tree retention, replacement protection details. So is that something that's expected uh, prior to um, uh, fourth reading? Or is there something in place now? Uh, Your Worship, that would be part of the process uh, that would be required by the proponents to provide to staff. Uh, it's the provisions that demonstrate the, uh, the trees that could be retained and those that cannot, and uh, uh, a replacement regime pursuant to the bylaw. Uh, with respect to the density provisions, the uh, reference in the plan provides for an increase from 6 UPA, uh, six units per acre to 15 units per acre if they are able to preserve trees. Uh, so as stated previously, just to clarify, the proponents uh, have been asked to consider that and have uh, elected to proceed with the, uh, the lower density and, uh, and not take advantage of the density, density provisions of the plan. And 6 EPA, just to help me out here, how many square feet is that a lot? Is that about 7,000 square foot lots or...? Five? Five or seven? Six times seven. Four, four. Yeah, that's correct, Your Worship. Six is about 7,000 square foot lots. 7,000 square foot lots is what this would be. But if we want to preserve the trees, we'd be adding, uh, well, I guess multifamily for 15 UPA. Okay. Uh, that would be the townhouse type of yeah. uh, housing, Your Worship, almost, yeah. Yeah, okay. Thank you. <clears throat> so on the, I guess, um, referral motion, uh, Councillor Arneson. Oh, thank you, Worship. Um, I just want to say that uh, I'm very much in support of this. I, I too had uh, similar questions, and I would be uh, very supportive of sending it back to staff to look at a different layout. Um, without an arborist report, I really couldn't speculate as to why it is that you know the the trees. You know, if it's a business decision to say, okay, well, we prefer lower density because that's what we think is most favorable. I mean, that's one thing. But um, I look at this 
is an opportunity to say if we have 225 significant trees, I would like to see where we can reallocate those homes of whatever type. And clustering is certainly something that we talked a lot about in our um, Brookswood and Fernridge plan, and so I think that a uh, similar proposition uh, should be taking place here. That's why I'm supportive of sending it back, and let's see a different neighborhood plan, because I don't see any rationality in saying, well, we're just going to say, irrespective of what opportunities have been presented, they prefer to have this. Well, I prefer to have some more trees existing in the neighborhood, So, but I would be very interested to know when it comes back what percentage of the trees uh, we could actually protect based on maybe a couple of layouts to see what that would look like. So I, I want to have a second look at this. Thank you. <clears throat> Councillor Whitmarsh. Yeah, I, sh I actually, uh, on this, I share some of the same um, concerns on the trees. Um, in addition to, to that, it, it talks about uh, replacing them, uh, if the 225 trees replace them with 185, which doesn't seem to be as well adequate based on some of the other proposed development proposals we've had, which has been closer to a one-to-one -one relationship. So I'm concerned about that even uh, beyond the saving of those trees. And so I have some of the similar concerns. I, I also have issues around maybe the width of the roads. I'm not sure exactly how wide 70A is. If it's a wide enough road to be able to park on both sides, I have concerns about the lane um, and uh, whether there could not be a better design around that. So for a number of reasons for me, um, I would prefer to see this go back to staff and consider uh, certainly the trees, the width of roads, the lane, a number of things uh, before we pass first and second reading. Thank you. Councilor Richter. Um, yes, I just wanted uh, to see if Councillor Long remembered, um, I believe we did a council van tour back around that whole area. And there aren't that many big stands of big trees uh, in that area, but this was one of them. The other one, I think, was at the corner of 72nd and 208th. Uh, in any event, um, my question is through you to Mr. Backen. Uh, if we pass this tonight, how do we make sure that they just don't go in and clear cut tomorrow? Your Worship, that would have some significant uh, repercussions as, as to future development applications. Um, we have a provision that if there is some creek uh, cutting within a, a certain period prior to the development application being processed, uh, that there are uh, restrictions and that Council can effectively um, uh, defer their application uh, and do and direct other activities for a, a much lengthier period of time. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Council Long. Thanks, Your Worship. I'm not sure exactly the wording of the motion, but it certainly seems clear to me that the, the staff needs to come back perhaps with a presentation. I don't know if that's appropriate. I'd like to see some more photographs, uh, this whole issue of the lane um, and, and other areas. I mean, to this probably to the north, what's going to happen with that too? Apparently the, the stand of trees goes, uh, extends into there. So can, can, is that what the motion is asking for, that staff come back with uh, some rationale as to why this is being proposed, or we're just going to direct them to... Excuse me, um, Mr. Backman, or, the, or Ms. Bauer, if you could read the motion, that might help clarify. Perhaps I could take a stab, Your Worship. Uh, just, uh, I haven't written anything down, but uh, my understanding is that it's being referred back to staff to discuss with the proponent the requirement for those trees, the, the significant trees on this property to be protected through the density bonus provisions of the plan. Okay, so I think I can support that because staff will bring it back to us and, and tell us what's going to happen next, right? Thank, Thank you. you. Any other discussion on the referral? Um, generally, I'd like to see these things go to a public hearing so we can hear from all parties and hear from the proponent and what they have, to plan, what they have plans uh, for and that on third reading we can make these sorts of decisions. But I think at this time uh, if we can get a report back uh, and uh, s staff can uh, work expeditiously with the proponent, and come up with something that perhaps I can come back uh, fairly quickly, one way or the other, and then we can uh, move on with this. So I'll support that. Uh, with that, I'll call a question on F1 on the referral. And it carries unanimously. And we move on to um, bylaws for first, second, and third reading, G1. The 2018 Langley Annual Rates and Tax uh, Collection Bylaw for Universal Services, bylaw number 5363. Could I have a motion, please? Councillor Sparrow, second by Councillor Davis. Uh, I got to clear this. 
Okay, discussion on G1. Council Richter. Um, this bylaw includes the tax rate that Council approved, which was how much again, Mr. Backen? 2.47%. Which I didn't support, so I won't be supporting this bylaw either. All right, thank you. I will be supporting this bylaw because we got to pay our staff. I'll call the question on G1. And it carries with Council Rector opposed. G2 is Langley Fees and Charges Bylaw Amendment, Bylaw Number 5368 and Bylaw Number 5359. Uh, just, just quick clarification. 68 and 59, is that correct? Or is, it, is there a typo? Okay, that is correct. So 5368 and 5359. Moved by Councilor Long, second by Councilor Sparrow. Discussion on G2. Seeing none, call the question. That carries unanimously. Move on to bylaws for consideration third reading. H1 is rezoning application number 100481 and development permit application number 100898, bylaw 5306. This is ICB, ICBC and UNITOL. Could I have a motion, please, for third reading? Councillor Davis and seconder. Councillor Whitmarsh, uh, discussion on H1. Councillor Richter. Uh, based on the density of the housing right across the street and the noise that is going to be generated as well as the increased truck traffic, I, I don't believe this is a suitable location for that kind of a testing facility. Um, I believe that the location should be further to the west, um, preferably in the industrial park and not right across from high density residential. That's just not fair to those people. So I'm not supporting this. Thank you, Councilor Qualley. Thank you. I have a question through you, Mr. Mayor, to staff. Um, during the public hearing, we heard from ICBC, the proponent, that there, um, that there would be no use or limited use of backup beepers in the lot. Um, Mr. Seffi, are you able to confirm that that's possible or not? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. The, uh, I guess, suggestion by the proponent uh, staff has looked into further and discussed it with ICBC. And uh, while they could suggest it, it is uh, admittedly by them, it is uh, impossible for them to be able to enforce because of the fact that uh, there are different schools that operate uh, I guess the, uh, the the process uh, of of licensing and the testing, and uh, and because of that, uh, it is not practical to to actually enforce such a, a restriction. Okay, thank, thank you, you. Councillor Sparrow. Thank you. Um, I I share the concerns of of the amount of traffic and uh, the traffic flow in this area. I, I used to live actually just down the way from here, and I can't actually imagine um, having even more vehicles and having the, the, the traffic kind of coming and going and, and encouraging that um, extra um, amount of traffic, uh, truck traffic in that area. As it is, it's already very um, difficult to maneuver, especially at certain times of the day. Um, so I struggle. I think this would be much more suited further into the industrial. Like this is right sort of on the edge of going into the residential side of things. And um, I, feel, uh, I feel like the use and um, the amount of traffic, I, I just have some concerns with that um, being put into this area. I just think that it's a little bit too close to the residential side of things for, um, for my uh, ability to support it. So. Thank you. Councillor Arneson. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. Um, yeah, I won't be supporting this either. I really struggled with looking at this in, uh, in consideration of the fact the proponent had apparently been looking with the client for three years to find a suitable site, and I know that can happen. But um, shortly after I was elected to council, I remember the conversation about the Volvo dealership and how we had um, maybe created inadvertently not a very good um, sort of interface between a residential use and one that, unbeknownst probably to, um, to council, 
would be noisier than anticipated. So I thank Mr. Safey for bringing forward the further details about the beepers because I think that's a very important consideration and I think that there was um, an inference that potentially if there was enough sound mitigation that it wouldn't be a problem. But overall, I think as we grow, we have to make sure that we're having really um, good and sound planning principles for potentially incompatible uses. And so I, I think all things considered, um, I wouldn't be supporting this just because of those incompatibility issues. Thank you. Council Long? Well, Your Worship, as you can see from the diagram here, it's uh, going to be buffered because all the activity happens to the north. And uh, it, from what I can tell, coming in and out will be from 97th. Uh, I don't think you go for a test at, in, at nighttime. I think it's uh, daytime operation. So uh, considering some other uses that could be proposed for the property, I, I think this may not be that bad as all that, and especially with the buffering of the building and the landscaping and so forth on the, uh, on the south section. So I'm fine with it. Thank you. Councilor Davis. Could we see that picture? Was that a picture of the building that was there? Because my... Okay, so that's not a two-story building. and There's only one, but... Just maybe go back to that. Okay, yeah. Oh, the, uh, this is a is this a building on the right hand side? Um, the building your worship is located to the uh, towards the south portion of the site, uh, near 96 Avenue, and just I guess uh, to uh, confirm for council's uh, information, the landscaping buffer along the uh, the north and south property lines is about five meters in in, in depth. And along the east and west property lines is, is three meters in depth. So how is it? It's just five meters in depth, but it's how high is it? Is it does it go in a? Is it is it going to? Because I know that if they're they're just testing motor vehicles in here, like trucks and motorcycles, testing drivers, t testing the drivers. Yeah. So yeah. it's not like somebody's going to get out and start beating on a, um, um, you know, impact guns and all that sort of stuff. But um, yeah, just a comment thought maybe the the building might create a, a buffer as well as the buffer that's there. Thank you. Councilor Richter. Yeah, um, I believe the proponent at the public hearing did say that the trucks enter off of uh, 96th and go out on 97th, so it's like a loop. So there'll be a constant flow of traffic in that area all day long. That's everything. Okay, thank you. Councilor Long. Uh, well, no, I think I'm okay. okay. Yeah. Is anything else, uh, Council? Okay, I'd just like to wrap this up before I call the, the vote. Uh, now, I have a question first for Mr. Sefi. The existing zoning, uh, what, allow, what types of use would be allowed in the existing zoning? Would, would a distribution center, 24-hour operation, be allowed there? Or manufacturing, or what sort of uses are there? Your Worship, the existing zoning is service industrial, so uh, that provides for some manufacturing. Okay, so, you know, listening, you know, when this proposal came forward, uh, you know, I had similar concerns as I've heard because it's close to residential. However, when you look at the compar comparables and what could be in there, uh, I think it's going to be a lot more um, detrimental to the neighboring residents to have uh, some sort of the other uses that could be there with a lot more traffic and, and a lot more noise. This is uh, fairly passive in comparison. It's testing drivers, doing their, you know, I've done my motorcycle test, and you go around the cones pretty slowly on small motorcycles. And, yeah, it's five, and it's five days a week during the daytime, not night shift. It's not during the weekends. Uh, you've got uh, um, people getting their driver testing done on trucks and doing their backup and doing the procedures uh, that they have to show the instructor and show the tester that they're proficient at uh, operating a vehicle. Uh, that's a very passive use, and I've done both those tests. Uh, I did fail my class one, by the way, but... Uh, my son loves that. But anyways, uh, it, it is very passive, and I, I really will support this. Uh, the other thing is about the beepers, and I, and I understand the concerns. However, we just had a good presentation on a day uh, to remember those who have been killed in the workplace, and, and beepers um, are on trucks for a very good reason. Uh, they save lives, and so uh, you know, I wouldn't want to compromise safety uh, because of, of uh, a daytime use during business hours when noise is expected from a an, an, uh, manufacturer industrial area. So I, I um, certainly will support this, uh, this um, third reading. I think it's a good use. I think that if it doesn't go in, something will come in there. That's going to be a lot more detrimental to the, to the residents. This is uh, probably uh, the best use we could get for it. 
Your Worship, just yes. just to confirm the, the some of the uses that that could be, uh, I guess, more intensive than the others include auction marts, lumber yards, vehicle auto body shops, vehicle servicing, vehicle sales, uh, towing, uh, etc. So there, there's a multitude, and this one is probably of all of those one of the most passive. Okay, so on um, third reading, I'll, we'll call the question. And it carries with Councillor Richter, Councillor Arneson, Councillor Sparrow opposed. And we move on to bylaws for consideration, third and final reading. And just prior to before uh, I, we get a, a mover and a seconder, uh, just a quick um, uh, update, Mr. Sefi, on we're going to third and final reading, and, and I understand all of the requirements have been met. And uh, so it, it is unusual, but there is a bit of a time, time uh, sensitive, sensi sensitivity to this uh, for the proponent. Could you just add some comments to that? Uh, yes, thank you, Worship. Uh, staff were able to uh, pursue the requirements for uh, approval by the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure, I guess, a bit more rigorously than, than normal because of the timing constraints that the proponents were under. And I'm uh, pleased to inform Council that staff was able to obtain that, so Council can give the bylaw third and final at the same time. Thank you. Councillor Long moves. Councillor Sparrow seconds. Uh, discussion, Councillor Richter? Well, under our procedure bylaw and any other legal requirements that we have, are we allowed to give third and final in one sitting? Yes, under the uh, legislation, um, council is allowed to give two readings on one evening. So uh, as you see, uh, first and second readings we do quite routinely, and we're also uh, under uh, pr provincial legislation allowed to do two readings. And uh, we have done third and finals in the past, at least uh, during my uh, term as mayor, and this is not... Um, not something that's unusual, Mr. Bakken? That's correct, Your Worship. Thank you. Okay, any further discussion? Call the question. Carries unanimously. And move on to... Uh, next, Your Worship, the endorsement. You've now been given oh, it yes. second and third, but the endorsement. Now the... Uh, for the... Um, excuse me. Do, 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 do the endorsement, the liquor endorsement. So moved by Councilor Long, second by Councilor Qualley. Discussion on that. I see none. I'll call the question. <coughs> Carries unanimously. And move on to bylaws for final adoption. J1 is 2018 Local Area Service Tax Bylaw, Bylaw 5360 and 5361. Could I have a motion of Councilor Arneson, second by Councilor Whitmarsh. Discussion? See none. Call the question on J1. And carries unanimously. And move on to the mayor's report. Uh, so, let's let staff get the presentation up. Oh, good evening, everyone. Uh, um, before I go on to my report, uh, I don't know, uh, many of you probably have heard the tragic news that came out of Toronto today. And uh, we learned earlier this afternoon, and I've just seen an update, maybe it's changed, but 10 people were killed and several others injured when they're struck by a van while walking along Young Street. Uh, this was a terrible and senseless incident, and it's being felt across the nation and around the world. Our thoughts, prayers, and deepest sympathies are with their loved ones and the city of Toronto. Uh, another tragedy, and I saw a brief news release on it. Uh, they're saying it's not an act of terrorism. It's a single person with some issues, mental issues. So uh, tragedy nevertheless. And uh, we certainly have the city in our, in our uh, thoughts and prayers tonight. Uh, it's just too bad we've had two major tragedies, one on top of the other in Canada. And uh, hopefully this doesn't occur again. On Tuesday, April 10th, was the first meeting of the Social Sustainability Task Force. Councillor Qualley, Councillor Arneson, and I were pleased to welcome the members. Last year, Council approved the preparation of a social sustainability strategy that will help guide the Township's actions on social issues over the next decade. The Task Force will help prepare the strategy by working alongside Township staff in generating ideas and providing feedback at key points throughout the process. I'd like to thank all the members for volunteering their time. The Ice Oasis Cat Intake and Isolation Facility Grand Opening took place on Thursday, April the 12th at the Langley Animal Protection Society location. The facility is the first of its kind in Canada and we're thrilled to see it come to life next to the Paddy Dale Animal Shelter. For years, Jane Nelson and the staff at LAPS, along with many dedicated volunteers and generous financial contributors, have enthusiastically worked towards making this shelter a reality. And uh, we, we listened to some speakers there, and this is the, the only one of its kind in Canada. And, and I'm 
would venture to guess probably in North America, and uh, certainly uh, leaders again in the township of Langley. Thursday evening, I attended the Aldergrove Credit Union Young Leaders Network event. Uh, this event aims to bring together a variety of different industry experts and, and our books, they're called books, and uh, are willing to share their experience, advice, and journey with young leaders throughout the credit union system. I'd like to thank Gus Hartle and the Aldergrove Credit Union for hosting this event. And I had a great time. It's amazing, the young people that are working for them and the questions they asked, and, and uh, had, a, had a really good evening. On Friday, April 13th, I was interviewed by Metro Vancouver on how the township is improving fish-bearing streams and creeks. We use fish-friendly designs when replacing stormwater culverts and undertake bank stabilization and steam restoration projects that can transform a stream in poor health into an environmental showpiece in areas where creeks and streams were previously unpassable for fish. Municipal construction projects are improving waterways to make them passable, thereby improving habitat for fish in our natural environment. We're fortunate to have several active environmental groups in our municipality acting as watershed stewards and providing positive examples to our youth and adults. The Langley Centennial Museum helped host the third annual Langley Heritage Fair uh, to showcase and celebrate Langley Elementary School students and their Canadian Heritage projects. The fair was held at the Fort Langley Community Hall on Friday, April the 13th. Winners included Hadley McDonald, uh, he won Best Presentation, Logan Hal Halchik uh, won Docents Award, Olivia Werner won the Most Original Topic, Isabella Davis won the Curator's Choice Award, Megan O'Shea won the Educator's Award of Excellence, and Ruby Pratt won the Artistic Achievement Award. Congratulations to all the students who participated, and I had a chance to look at some of the displays, and they're very creative and very informative. You do learn a lot when uh, talking to these young, young people. On Saturday, April the 14th, were two baseball season openers, and uh, I got the ball across the plate each time I threw the pitch. I was happy about that. Uh, first was Langley Fastball at Old Booth Park, and then it was off to Walnut Grove uh, for the North Langley Diamond Sports Softball Icebreaker Tournament, where I threw out the first pitch. And uh, that's not me pitching, by the way, up in the red there. That's... Thanks for that. Yeah, I just want to make sure everybody's aware. I... Saturday, April 14th, uh, sorry, I just did that one. Thursday, April 19th, was the annual RCP Volunteer Appreciation Dinner at the Langley Golf Center. Uh, the members of the RCP have a big responsibility, and so do members of the community who help them as their eyes, ears, and educators for the Langley RCMP. Uh, they have an important role to play when it comes to patrolling our neighborhoods, providing support and resources to those who need them, teaching the public how to protect themselves, and giving them the tools they need to stay safe, whether through block watch, speed watch, citizens patrol, at community events, or in community policing offices. Everything they do has a direct impact on our homes and businesses and on our streets. These volunteers help make this a safe community and contribute to the excellent quality of life that we enjoy here in Langley. And a great thank you to all of our volunteers. Later Thursday evening was the fundraising gala for the Memory Grove that is being planted in Fort Langley. We have a legacy of planting trees in the township of Langley, and it's wonderful to see it continue in this way. The Grove will pay tribute and act as a reminder to those individuals who helped make this the community it is today and will benefit residents, visitors, and the environment for many generations to come. The official ribbon cutting ceremony for the Memory Grove is on Saturday, April 28th at the Salmon River Natural Area. And uh, former Mayor Kurt Alberts uh, was uh, spearheaded this, one of the spearheaders, to make this a reality. And uh, it's the horse chestnut trees that are lined along Glover Road will be replaced along with some Western Red Cedars. I think it was Western Red Cedars. Uh, so it's going to be just a beautiful addition to our parks. And uh, thanks to all the volunteers who did that. On Saturday, April 21st, uh, was the annual Plates and Glasses event at Fort Langley Community Hall. The food and wine pairing was excellent, and it was a sold-out event. Langley Hospice hosts this event annually, with all proceeds going to their foundation. On Sunday, April 22nd, uh, started with a viewing of the annual British Car Show in Fort Langley, where the theme this year was the Working Man's Car. Uh, this exhibition was well attended, and as judge, I chose the 19. 68 Morris Minor Traveler, wood panel station wagon is the winner uh, this year, owned by Kerry Turner, and uh, he's a Fort Langley resident, and I, I didn't know that at the time, but a uh, beautiful car, uh, well restored and well maintained, and I think a good example of what you know, kind of vehicle you went to work with every day and made deliveries in and took the kids on a picnic. Um, if it starts, yeah. <laughs> I didn't ask them to start it. Community Arbor Day also took place on Saturday, Sunday afternoon, Earth Day, at Philip Jackman Park in Aldergrove. The weather was perfect, and we had a great number of attendees this year. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone who helps organize this annual tree planting event and celebration of the environment. Lastly, congratulations to Langley's Laura Jane Tidball, who is part of the Canadian team that won the team show jumping competition at the Longines National Nations Cup 
in, Qua in Coapexpan, Mexico, on su Sunday, April 22nd. This was the second of three qualifying events in the North and Central American and Caribbean League for the Longines Na Nations Cup Final, which will be held in Barcelona in October. The Canadian team also won the first qualifier in Florida in February. The third and final qualifier will be held on June 3rd at the Tidball Family's Thunderbird Show Park here in the Township of Langley. And as I understand it, it's the first year that Laura Jane uh, has ridden on the Canadian national team. So congratulations to, to LJ. Upcoming events, um, Thursday, April 26th is Municipal Awareness Day. That is the day that the Township of Langley turns 145 years old. And our Township Hall will be bustling with young school children going through and learning all about what uh, we do in a municipality. On Thursday, April 26th, as up in the evening, is the Upcycling Challenge Awards evening at uh, Willowbrook Shopping Centre. And on sun Saturday, April 28th, is a day of mourning. Uh, the QP uh, T Township of Lanning is planning a moment of silence at the Civic Facility and the Operation uh, Facility on Friday, April 27th. And May 6th is a Langley Walk, uh, definitely a must must do in Langley. It starts this year at the George Preston Recreation Centre. So with that, that's the end of my mayor's report. If any uh, council has anything to add, Councillor Long. I just wanted to mention, I think that the 28th is also the annual cleanup day. Oh yes, and that's right. So there are different events happening throughout the township and uh, check the website and get involved with uh, cleaning your community. Great, thank you. Thanks for pointing that out. And Councillor Arneson. It's not a report, it's a notice of motion. Well, we're not there yet. We're not there yet? No. Sorry. I'm always ahead of myself and everybody else. I apologize. We'll Just give there. me the high sign. Thank we'll you. We'll get there. That's what, yeah. Which is now. Oh. Is there any other business? <laughs> <laughs> now we're there. Oh, but you got to wait. you got to wait for the mayor. Oh, no, no, sorry. There is one. Yeah, oh, sorry. This. Uh, yeah, there is, uh, there is other business. So you're, you're throwing me off my whole game plan yeah. here and strategy yeah. and the way I run this meeting. That's okay. We'll survive. There is a notice of motion here by Councillor Richter, and I'm going to put. I'm just going to clear the queue. Put Councillor Richter on. Councillor Richter, you can move your motion and speak to it if you wish. Thank you. Whereas the Metro Vancouver Board is an appointed part-time position for local politicians who are already paid by their respective municipalities, whereas the Metro Vancouver Board representatives are well compensated and paid a generous per meeting stipend and expenses. Therefore, be it resolved that Langley Township Council request its voting members on the Metro Vancouver Board to vote against a Metro Vancouver Board pension or retirement allowance. I move. Okay. Moved by Councilor Richter, second by Councilor Long. Yeah, any, and any, okay, I wanted to, to just say, uh, it, interesting, we got the uh, schedule of remuneration and expenses for the year ended December 31st, and our representatives on the board uh, between base salary and expenses, Charlie Fox was paid twenty-six thousand. Uh, the mayor was paid eleven thousand, and Councillor Long was paid thirty thousand. So I think getting this kind of money, in addition to the salary already drawn as a councillor in the community, um, I really don't think uh, a pension is necessary. Great, thank you, Councillor Long. I just wanted to say I'll support that, and, uh, and in fact, I've already given a notice of motion to the, the Metro Board to have this reconsidered, but it is not accurate to say it's a pension because it's not a pension. Not that I support it, but the word pension is a bit misleading, but I'm happy um, to abide by the request, and I'm glad that the motion says request, Your Worship, because actually members of the Metro Vancouver Board are not fettered by the Council to make decisions. But anyway, I seconded it, and I'll do my very best to have it overturned on Friday. Thank you. Any other discussion? See none, I'll call the question. That carries unanimously. And Councillor Arneson, let me get you on. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, my notes of motion. Uh, whereas Mayor and Council have now received a CPC presentation from staff regarding affordable housing options, and whereas Council deems that the provision of affordable housing options within the Township are a necessary and vital component of the common community good in order to support social sustainability, and whereas concrete affordable housing strategies align with policy directives already found within adopted Council resolutions, including the Township of Langley Housing Action Plan, Sustainability Charter, and the nascent Social Sustainability Strategy. Therefore, be it resolved, the Council directs staff to proceed with a needs assessment 
based on current TOL demographics to inform a review of best management practices for metro-wide communities in order to provide appropriate formulas and strategies and identify all relevant opportunities for the township to collaborate and partner with senior levels of government and housing service providers as well as the development community and community stakeholders in order to achieve this necessary social goal in a fair and equitable manner. Thank you. Is there any other business? Seeing none, motion to terminate. Termination. Councilor Davis, seconded by Councilor Whitmarsh. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. We'll take a few minutes just to um, switch over to the public hearing. and. Uh,